Intuitively, does 0.9 recurring equal 1? For a disbeliever, intuitively, 0.9 recurring must be process related. But for most mathematicians, 0.9 recurring equals 1 has an intuitive explanation that forms the basis of what's called the epsilon delta definition of a limit. If you think 0.9 recurring can't possibly equal 1, then the mathematicians have good and bad news for you. The good news is that they will accept an argument for 0.9 recurring does not equal 1, but only if you've redefined 0.9 recurring to be something other than a real number, and you've used your own non-standard rules of logic. The bad news, they will tell you, is that by default, 0.9 recurring is a real number. And if you use the accepted rules of real analysis, then it is a provable fact that 0.9 recurring equals 1. If you are not a mathematician, then all of this might sound very confusing and very strange. Surely it either equals 1 or it doesn't. But now we're being told that the statement can have different meanings in different mathematical systems. That sounds very weird. What's going on? Before we discover the mathematician's intuitive explanation, let's consider the intuition of a disbeliever. A disbeliever's first thought is that surely something as fundamental as a number should have a tangible meaning. Take the fraction one third for example. We call it a number, but isn't it really two numbers with a line between them? It has a tangible meaning in that we know it means one third of something, such as one third of a cake for example. But then what tangible meaning can 0.9 recurring have? It appears to go on endlessly. And surely there can't be an actual infinity of digits, because that would be absurd. If we abandon the idea that 0.9 recurring is a single value, and we think of it as a sequence of values, then we can give it a tangible meaning that we can relate to the real world. The sequence could represent values that could be produced from a set of instructions otherwise known as an algorithm, such as one for travelling distances between positions A and B. Step 1 tells us to travel 9 tenths of the remaining distance. So from the start, this will get us to position 0.9. Step 2 simply tells us to go back to step 1. This time, 9 tenths of the remaining distance will take us to the position 0.99. And if we keep following the algorithm, we will be following the 0.9 recurring sequence of values. And so 0.9 recurring is short for the sequence 0.9, 0.99, 0 0.999, and so on, which are values that could be produced from an associated algorithm. Each attempt to follow the instructions will be a process, and each attempt to follow the instructions must come to an end at some point, so everything here is finite. So there's no infinite process here, just a finite set of instructions. This interpretation of 0.9 recurring is completely finite. We can construct lots of different sequences, but only a few of them will map neatly onto the place value system of base 10 decimals. Each term in the sequence 0 0.9, 0 0.99 and so on is the nth sum of the corresponding series. And since it maps neatly to our decimal system, we can write it in a way that looks like a decimal. Mathematicians refer to the nth sum expression as the partial sum expression. Disbelievers might prefer to avoid the phrase partial sum, as it implies that there is a full sum, and for a disbeliever there isn't one. The mathematicians will tell us, no, that's not what 0.9 recurring means at all. It represents an abstract object called a real number. And we can think of real numbers as being points on a number line. Using this number line concept, they claim there's an intuitive way to show 0.9 recurring must equal 1. First, place 0.9 on the number line. And notice that the distance between that point and 1 is 1 tenth. Next place 0.99 on the number line. And notice that the distance between that point and 1 is 1 hundredth. Put 0.999 on the number line. 
and the distance to 1 is 1 thousandth. Generalising, the distance from the nth term to 1 will be 1 over 10 to the power n. So if 0.9 recurring was less than 1, we should be able to find a point that's between 1 over 10 to the power n and the point 1 for all possible values of n. And since no point exists, it must equal 1. In other words, they are saying that 0.9 recurring must equal 1 because if you give me any point before 1, then I can find an nth sum that's closer to 1 than your point. But this is a cat and mouse argument, and we can easily switch the roles of cat and mouse around by saying, you give me any nth sum, and I can give you a point that's closer to 1 than your nth sum. And since this will work for all possible nth sums, points must exist between 0.9 recurring and 1. So these are two equal and opposite arguments. One implies there can't be any points between them, and the other implies there must be points between them. You might think this shows that 0.9 recurring cannot be any fixed value, and so it must be process related. But the mathematicians want to justify their preconceived notion of so-called real numbers, in which a real number has a fixed place on the number line. So they choose to only accept arguments that fit in with what they want to be true. So they want the first argument to be valid, and the second argument to be invalid. It doesn't matter a jot that these are exactly the same argument just switched around. It doesn't matter that this is an inconsistent approach to logical reasoning. The only thing that matters to them is that they can claim their concept of real numbers is consistent. And if it can be made consistent by rejecting the second argument, then so be it. To a disbeliever, this can't be a valid approach, because any ridiculous notion can be called consistent if we are allowed to reject any argument that shows it to be inconsistent. So, the first problem with the mathematician's intuitive explanation is that they reject an equivalent argument. Another huge problem is the whole idea of infinitely small points on an infinitely divisible, infinitely thin number line that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. I can imagine a thick line, but when I try to imagine an infinitely thin line, it completely disappears. I don't believe anyone can imagine infinitely small points and infinitely thin lines. I believe those that think they can are wrong. They can't prove that they can conceive of the infinite. It's a matter of belief and faith. And a third major problem is the problem of the last term. Given that all the points in the sequence 0 0.9, 0 0.99 and so on are supposedly static points on the number line, then how can there not be a last point? If we approach the number line from the right, then which of these static points will we encounter first? Or, if we think of these points in an ordered infinite set and we add a number that's bigger than 1 to this set, what number will immediately precede it? We can't just avoid the issue by saying the least upper bound is 1 because 1 is not in the set. Or if we approach 1 from the left, then how can we have passed an infinite amount of these points when we reach the point 1? And how can we not have passed a last point? But the mathematicians will claim there's no problem of a last point, because mathematics has been formalised in such a way that these problems cannot be stated. We are not allowed to ask which of the static points is the last one, we are only allowed to talk about the least upper bound or supremum. In other words, yet again, they have simply decided to dismiss any arguments that would expose a problem with their preconceived ideas about so-called real numbers. So their supposedly intuitive explanation not only requires you to be able to imagine infinitely small points on an infinitely thin line, but it provides no intuitive real-world example no reason for rejecting the argument that it cannot equal 1, and no intuition on how there cannot be a last point. They'll say 0.9 recurring equals 1 is a statement about real numbers, and so if we want to discuss the validity of this statement, then we must accept all their rules of real analysis, otherwise we're not talking about the same thing. And if we accept all their made-up rules about non-physical abstract objects, we'll have to admit they are right. Almost all mathematicians have faith in their arguments for real numbers. 
but not quite all of them. A few mathematicians reject infinity, and one mathematics professor has spoken out. He claims that Real numbers are at the core of most foundational problems. There is no such thing as the square root of two. There are no such things as infinite sets. We need to rethink a lot of mathematics. We need to expel infinity. And the statement 0.9 recurring equals 1 should be taken with a large grain of salt. When we examine the timeline for the development of the modern concept of a limit, we find there was a period of over 200 years from the introduction of unending decimals by Simon Stevin in 1594, before several mathematicians devised the limit approach to real numbers. If the limit argument is so intuitive, then why did it take so long to be devised? So who wins the battle for the best intuitive explanation? As disbelievers, we relate mathematics to physical reality, and 0.9 recurring is process-related. Nobody can truly conceptualise infinitely small things. Mathematicians simply reject any troublesome arguments, and they think it's fine to avoid problems by not allowing them to be formally stated. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what disbelievers think, because the mathematicians decide what the rules are in their abstract world, so if they claim that their intuitive explanation is correct, the rest of us are expected to just accept it. And since people generally like to believe in non-physical things, and that they can conceive of the infinite, the supporters of real numbers will always be viewed as the winners.